You're about to hear my conversation with Benoit Javet, who leads our resource team. We talk all about inflation, longer term inflation expectations, and why it's likely that they're higher. Also, how to think about the commodity space in the new environment. I hope you enjoy. This podcast is for informational purposes only. Information relating to investment approaches or individual investments should not be construed as advice or endorsement. Listeners should seek professional advice for their situation. Welcome to the McKinsey Investments Podcast. My name is Matthew Schnur. I'm delighted to be back with Benoit Gervais, who leads our natural resource team. Benoit, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Benoit, back in September of 2022, you launched the McKinsey Inflation Focused Fund. Uh, I remember it well, and at the time, uh, you were of the opinion that inflation had a, a, a better than likely a chance of becoming more entrenched than perhaps markets were expecting at the time. I thought we'd bring you back on the, the podcast and get your renewed view on inflation, or perhaps just an update on, on where we sit on that uh, right now. When we launched the inflation fund in September 2022 was on the back of very high inflation numbers. The CPI would be the key measure, I guess, or the main measure of this. And we found ourselves on the back of this declining inflation ever since. But the real question, you're right, is is what are the long-term inflation expectations? Because at the time, I think that many of us, uh, including the Fed, would have said, well, you know, this is very temporary. It's all related to the supply chain issues. Some of that related to the war. Some of it related to the COVID uh, consequences. And it would abate back to what we would have said at the time, normalized level 2%. Right. And what's interesting is that since then, those long-term expectations have moved up gradually in the high twos. and the relationship, which was perceived as a negative take on the world, has slowly turned out to be much better than we would have hoped for. We have to separate inflation in, in two types of inflation. One is a supply-led problem. Supply chain, that's how we call it, bottlenecks, that's how we call it a year ago, which is... Uh, causing supply to be much more expensive and it tends to be fixed over time as those bottlenecks are dealt with. And today, we have a demand-led inflation. Right, So we have the proceeds of the handouts still in the hands of people. I think most would say that those this, this bank account is slowly being drained. Sure. Um, and then we will find out how much of it was the result of those handouts and how much of it is a self-fulfilling, uh, uh, self-fulfilling mechanism where high wages encourage high wages and encourage more consumption. Um, we are seeing across the world, and in particular the Western world, more wage pressures, right? Some of the largest pools of labor, think of UPS, United Steel Workers. Now here in Canada, we have the teachers going on strike in Quebec. They're going on strike um, this week. And everybody's asking not for one or two. Right. Who's asking for one or two? Who will settle for one or two? Nobody. And that eventually feeds itself back into the economy, and let's see how long this lasts. But the take was meant to be a very negative take on the world economy. Because there is inflation, therefore, rates will go up, and therefore, we will go into a recession. Right. But we are still waiting for this recession here in the U.S. Not to say that we couldn't have a slowdown, but the very negative link, economic link that was created by the market, this narrative that inflation is bad, therefore we're going into recession, is slowly being broken down. So you ask most people 40 years ago, and many of us weren't there for it to invest in the 80s, in the 70s, and in the 60s, 4% was acceptable. Sure. Then it became 3%. Then it became 2%. And we've all settled on this 
arbitrary number, 2% is good. What about if I told you that given the amount of debt that we have, 3% is better? I think people would settle for three. And Benoit, maybe I'll just sort of try to confirm what you've just said or, or I, at least let you know how I'm making sense of it and, and let me know if I'm uh, off base or not. But there's there's a definitely different types of inflation. The supply-led inflation was what was largely considered to be transitory. That was sort, certainly the narrative going back through uh, twenty early part of, uh, I guess, late, latter part of 2021, early part of 2022. Um that clearly has shifted into something that's a little bit more sticky uh, with the uh, wage-driven inflation, and that this wage-driven inflation isn't necessarily bad for the economy. This is something that that can act the economy can continue to perform well during, uh, despite the fact that it leads to higher interest rates. Is that is that a reasonable summary? People are making more money and therefore will consume more, and we know the story around the consumer uh, in the U.S. in particular right? They consume what they earn, right? Hopefully they will save one day. Uh, but right now, hand them out. We are consuming what we earn. And we're seeing this in most of the data, despite the high interest rate, a lot of pockets of the economy are still strong. Now, the question is how long this will last? Is this a temporary demand led inflation? Or is, are, are we going to see many years of this? And I think that you have to make peace with three key questions. Do we want to deal with climate and the issues surrounding this? I'll call that the energy transition. If so, we will have to make investments sure. in many parts of our economy to deal with those, in particular, emission controls. Right, so just about everything, and in particular power, and in particular combustion, has to be dealt with. And the clean version of this is more expensive. Now we want to be kinder too. I think that we have social standards today that we didn't have perhaps 20 years ago when we entered the age of Dollarama, where the price was the most and the single most important factor in making a purchasing decision. Now we're saying, well, not only do we have the environment, we also have social standards. So if we will, if we're going to make polysilicon to go into solar wafers, and it's coming from slave labor, are we getting ahead? If we are importing steel to build those windmill towers from China, where the CO two emissions are two or three times full that of Europe or US, are we really getting ahead? Right. Now, we have social and environmental standards uh, that are different, and we will never agree with other countries, trading partners. And if we are serious, and I think the world is very serious about this, is, is that w- w- the best way to control those standards is to onshore many of those activities. Huh? We're not going to reshore everything. But certain element where it is impossible to control uh, environmental emissions because we can't perhaps measure it, or we will never really completely be sure where is the slave labor, then the best way to do this at a price, obviously, at a higher price, is to trade with people that are really close by, that we agree or even better, have it in our own country. And I think the U.S. is doing a lot of this. I think that's a global movement. They call it strategic investments. Um, I say, well, that's probably a way to control your supply chain, control your environmental standards, control your social standards. So all of this, right, is inflationary and to support this kind of industry right a manufacturing type of industry that's where all the emissions are really you need a very different type of infrastructure right so far we've gone through a few decades here of digital led of a digital led economy where it we didn't require a whole lot of new lanes of highways 
or investment in railroads, investment in big, heavy equipment on the Gulf Coast. And today, interestingly, that relationship between manufacturing capex and global uh, and uh, U.S. GDP has really broken out, right? So it was mm-hmm. a underperforming sector for decades. You know, all those jobs going to China and India and others. And then this reshoring exercise related to the key teams I just laid out has really pushed away that that uh, that proportionally speaking that spending into the manufacturing sector. So, do you think? that those are thematics, themes that will stick. If you do, then you're going to have to make peace that widgets and services will cost more in general. Because mostly this is about not more stuff or more quantity, it's about more quality. We're producing the same that China could be producing. We're just doing it with higher standards. And maybe maybe just to ask more about the quality component of it. What you've described here is very large infrastructure uh, projects that are largely either government-backed or or some sort of large corporation-backed, given that uh, you're talking about climate, you're talking about uh, the social infrastructure, onshoring, these types of things. I guess... One, is there any concerns on actually this being a sustainable trend? Like, are governments able to afford to continue to develop this infra- infrastructure? Um, two, is the population just going to insist on it and, and we're, we're going to uh, go ahead? Um, and then, and maybe talk about like the stickiness of that and any risks that you see that maybe this doesn't happen the way that you're anticipating. One way to keep honest all of those uh, decision investment decisions because they are coming at a premium is to say what is the value of this ton of carbon and i think that's been a a common exercise that many governments have entertained is to say well if we're going to tax co2 emission at 100 bucks a ton we are creating uh a new competitive landscape right, right. So people saying fifty dollars, hundred dollars. Here in Canada, we're thinking of going to one hundred and seventy. Now, if if you are a steel producer here in Canada, Selco, Dofasco, big producers, not a growth story. Um, probably not the lowest cost because it's cheaper to build mills and produce steel. Labor is cheaper in China and maybe sure. even imported. Uh, however, we have no control over their emissions. So let's say for a minute, we're going to be taxing our steel producers because we can control them by $100 a ton, round number. Steel prices on average you sell for, call it 800 and they produce two tons per ton. So now we're going from $800 a ton to $1,000 a ton. Now those producers have the decision to say, well, how can I cut? This, this, this cost of production, including taxes, right? Let's capture some of those, some of those CO2 tons. Let's use right. alternative industrial processes. This requires investments. Why would you deal with this? It, because you know that the steel coming from China has even higher emission. And if the government is serious about this, we'll say, you know what, Mr. China, we will charge you because we know what your we think we know what your steel mills are doing. They're producing three tons per ton, not two, but three. So we're going to charge you an extra hundred dollars. So we're going to tax you three hundred dollar, not two hundred dollar. Right. So now we have a hundred dollar advantage that was created for the local producer, which still needs to improve. Right? They're still producing two tons per ton. Right. But better than a three tons per ton in China. He has a hundred dollar advantage. Right. Right. Because everything is going to be priced off those imports. And he has a further incentive to go and collect this 200 by reducing his emissions. Right. So we're going to keep consuming steel to put in cars and windmills because we want to do this transition as well on the way. Spending is on the way. I think it will get cheaper to address those emissions 
if we're constructing some kind of competitive framework where there is a carrot, not just a stick. The stick hits first. That's the $200 a ton that we're just sure. going to charge them, period. You have to pay it. And there's probably one or two guys here in Canada that don't admit. They'll make a lot more. They'll collect the whole 200 right? Uh, and then there is a stick. Well, if you cut your emission, you're going to keep this 200 Same thing for power emissions, right? And there's a lot of gas uh, emission, gas turbines, power that has emissions. Right. Right? They can capture it if there is a framework to get compensated for it. In the U.S., they've moved along with this. The, we call the Inflation Reduction Act, is making it very uh, straightforward to go and collect those rebates and those subsidies and avoid taxes. And it's generating those investments. But back to this manufacturing uh, outperformance in the U.S. compared to the many decades previously. Great context makes a lot of sense. Uh, you referenced uh, steel during that discussion uh, as an example. Uh, as I'm thinking about this transition, I, I mean, your mind can really wander in anything that is tangible. Um, you, you think about the grid, you think about electric vehicles, you think about um, all of these, uh, everything that needs to be built uh, that is tangible. Um, what does that mean for the commodity complex, uh, Benoit? Um, certainly, oil and gas is something that uh, the world is trying to uh, move away from. Clearly, still an important part of the uh, energy sources, as uh, as we've seen over the past couple of years. So, what's your current view on on the commodity and the complex, and then how does that feed into the sort of longer term inflation picture? So, just to make a, a gen- generic comment, most commodities have a greener alternative. There's always a producer that can do it with less emissions, friendlier, nicer. Right. Um, and at the moment. The history has shown that a commodity is a commodity. So the the steel example that I just gave would be an example. There is a greener alternative. And either the companies buying that steel are going to be willing to pay uh, a premium. And there's there's not much proof of that yet, that, you know, Coca-Cola would be willing to pay for aluminum and a can of Coca-Cola more if it's coming from hydropower aluminum Hmm. versus aluminum China. So if they're not going to act then it's on the government to say, well, we will charge you more and you're going to have to make that decision. Is it worth paying the tax or not pay the tax? And I think that we call them commodities because they're all the same, but really if you're starting to apply this lens of environmental standard, then they're not the same. Right. They're not the same, right? So natural gas from Canada which is going to be instrumental to move away from coal in emerging markets. They'll probably use a mixture over there, a renewable power and gas power, and gradually phase out their coal. Not the ultimate goal, but a very good transitionary goal is to do that. Now the question is, which gas is better? Right? You could say, well, not too sure about human rights in Qatar. I like their human rights in Canada. I think that we have a good chance of producing LNG here. They could find natural gas going to Asia using most of it hydropower to refrigerate this 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 natural gas. Hmm. Right? So you can think of it there's there's going to be a whole benchmarking exercise and that's what we do here at McKinsey is trying to figure out Who's the more efficient producer using this lens, right? Efficient in capital markets has been largely captured by profit. Well, what is it going to be tomorrow if we're going to change um, your cost base going forward by including or not including this tax, right? Some of them will see a major impact. Some of them will be able to charge a premium just because they're greener and people are willing to pay for it. So there's a collection of commodities, and that's the beauty of what we do here at McKinsey, is to be able to not select the average, but select uh, a collection of companies that will do better than average when it comes to the environment and turn that into real profit, real return on capital, and real investments, right? Capital allocation going forward. 
Really interesting, Ben Masa. You're talking about almost a decommodification of commodities, which seems a novel, at least. Um, and I, I'm curious. So within that commodity space, I, I, I get your point on natural gas. I think that's a great example um, where it's produced in many places around the world. Uh, my, my, I guess, follow up question is: Given the um, infrastructure that's going to be built out, um, is it possible to have a firmly held, like sort of long-term view on what commodities are going to be benefiting from the types of infrastructure that's being built? Or is that, you know, is there too much noise in that? Like I hear, I think all the time about batteries and I remember even two years ago, maybe even last year, cobalt uh, being a really uh, challenging mineral uh, mined in terrible loca- locales under terrible conditions. But all of a sudden we're hearing battery technology maybe going away from that where you don't need as much. How 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 much view can you have in sort of the long-term nature of what specific commodities are likely to benefit? So one of the, if you go back to the main argument around EVs and why people were so scared when it came to oil consumption, was that the EV technological improvement would resemble that of an iPhone or a plasma TV where the cost right. would continually go down. Right. And what we found, it was a major differences in that those are big, big instruments. They're not digital. They're largely mechanical uh, or industrial processes when it comes to making cars. The battery is continuing to see cost improvements. That's true. And performance improvements, that's true as well. Uh, that is closer to technology than the actual car. The car closer to an industrial process, the battery closer to a technological process. We are seeing, call it exponential or asymptotic types of cost reduction. However, comes the risk that somebody has a breakthrough on those technology and starts using other metals, like you pointed out. Cobalt was instrumental, not so much anymore. Could you do the same with lithium? I think the assumption today that you can't, but if the sodium oxide or some other technology comes around, and usually they come around when those materials are too expensive and we sure. saw a big spike in lithium. And that's one of the reasons why some of the other technologies are drifting uh, away from, from lithium or avoiding lithium altogether, like they had for cobalt and we warn people. And that's why we say the energy transition is a lot more than just the battery metal. It's really about energy, right? This is just the, the lithium and the battery is just the container. Right. Now, you need the generation. And if we're going to electrify, and I don't see how the world is going to grow without electricity, I think on top of that, we're going to go away from combustion engines to electricity. You can add a few percentage points. So now the next question is, how do you get those gigajoules or those electrons in the form that people want? And that's where it gets really interesting. How do you deliver all of this? You can think of all kinds of ways, right? Do you want, first of all, the clean or the brown? There'll be a price for those two alternatives. Do you want it delivered at your home? Because everybody's charging at the same time on the same grid, their electric car, it won't work. Right. Do you want it fast on the highway on your way to Montreal or between Calgary and Edmonton? You don't want to waste two hours waiting for your car to be charged. So you're going to need an extra large transformer a big substation feeding all of those. And think of the trucks, the energy that you would need into a truck. Sure. Right? Um, Those that require your major investments. Do you want it downtown? Well, we need a different kind of infrastructure. Uh, Do you want it at night? Do you want it in the morning? And where do you want it in the world? You want it in Nigeria? You want it cheap, cheap? Then that's one alternative. So I think that the biggest companies like BP, like Shell, like Total are spending most of their time thinking about how will they get the right kind of energy with the right speed at the right time to the right person. So all of those questions weren't present. You produce a barrel, you produce a barrel, the market will get it there 
everybody's consuming just about the right kind, the, the, the same kind of energy in the same way. Now we're talking about all kinds of different ways. So what you've really done is you've laid out a case, I think, in my mind at least, for uh, structurally higher longer-term inflation above the 2% uh, number that uh, that people are predicting, really based off one wage growth that we've seen this year and that leading to, to more uh, sustained wage growth, and then two, this massive infrastructure spend that has to happen. Um, and part of that infrastructure spend is not only inflationary, but it is also going to sort of decommodify commodities, where there's going to be preferences based on the production, based on uh, both social and environmental standards uh, behind the production of those commodities. So really uh, a, a long-term commodity opportunity uh, and a long-term structurally higher inflation. Is that a fair summary, Benoit? A longer inflation, uh, longer-term inflation number and a increasingly finicky consumer and right. government will drive differentiation in some of those commodities and processes. And we have to go down the industrial change primary, which is what we specialize here in the research group, secondary, how do you make the car? How do you make the can of Coca-Cola? Uh, and the end consumer. In most of those emissions, in most of those problematic industries, they reside in those primary and a little bit into those secondary industries. And that's where the investment is needed. And it's a different kind of economy that we've had versus the past 30 years. For sure. And to be expected, changes are needed in our infrastructure. Now, one thing we didn't touch on, Matthew, maybe that's a topic for our next podcast, is in order to make those industries work, think of it as blue-collar uh, job, we need immigration to work. Mm. Uh, so here in Canada... Over the last two years, we've taken in 2 million new people. Right. I don't know about you, but two years ago, did you think there were extra spots at the hospitals? <laughs> extra spots in the schools? Sure. Extra spots on the highway? Clearly not, Benoit. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, you, so when you get yourself in, on those trends, talking about those long-term trends, and those people, it's not like they're going back to their country, right? They're saying sure. it's very difficult to get off those long-term trends. I would love to explore that in our next podcast, Benoit, in more detail. But uh, I want to thank you for spending the time with me, walking through that a really compelling case, I think, for uh, really rethinking your investment strategy. You mentioned the last 30 years aren't going to look anything like uh, what we're experiencing now. Also seems like just a wonderful opportunity for someone with deep expertise in active management within the resource complex specifically. Uh, as these sort of decommodify, all of a sudden it, it's, uh, it matters well by well and mind by mind where things are being produced uh so your your expertise is well suited for for what seems like the likely future so benoit thanks again uh, for coming on the podcast really appreciate the time thank you for having me the content of this podcast including facts views opinions and recommendations is not to be used or construed as investment advice and is not an offer or an invitation to buy or sell any security the content of this podcast should not be relied upon for any purposes and McKenzie Financial Corporation is not responsible for any reliance upon it. This podcast includes forward-looking information that reflects our current expectations or forecasts of future events. Forward-looking information is subject to risks, uncertainties, and assumptions that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed herein. Our views are subject to change based on market conditions. Commissions, trailing commissions, management fees, and expenses may be associated with mutual fund investments. Please read the fund facts and prospectus before investing. The indicated rates of returns are historical annual compounded total returns, including changes to unit values and reinvestment of all dividends or distributions and does not take into account sales, redemptions, distribution, or optional charges or income taxes payable by any security holder that would have reduced returns. 